In October 2017, a SWAT team showed up at Jameson Lopp's house in North Carolina, allegedly because of a fake complaint by a person angered by one of his tweets. So he posted a video of himself firing an AR-15 and then embarked on a journey to disappear in the physical world, unreachable by his enemies and far from the prying eyes of the surveillance state. Lop had been obsessed with privacy long before the swatting. He's visually a throwback to the long-bearded mathematicians and cypherpunks who in the 90s believed that recent breakthroughs in cryptography could enable levels of personal freedom and privacy beyond anyone's wildest dreams. Many of the ideas and technical innovations that came out of the cypherpunk movement were eventually folded into Bitcoin. Government is not a monolithic thing which is your enemy. It's a multitudinous thing which is your enemy. <laughs> Lop even calls himself a professional cypherpunk carrying on the movement's legacy. The company Lop co-founded, Casa, is trying to make it easier for people to hold custody of their own Bitcoin, in keeping with the cypherpunk ethos, instead of storing their money on third-party exchanges where regulators can impose arbitrary rules. After the SWAT raid, Lop changed his phone number, set up LLCs to hide his true name and address, encrypted his communications, and even bought a decoy house to serve as a physical mailing address, which he needed to satisfy the DMV's requirement for a driver's license. To check his work, he hired private investigators to tail him. We the cypherpunks are dedicated to building anonymous systems, wrote Eric Hughes in his 1993 manifesto, and we don't much care if you don't approve of the software we write. Jameson Lopp is an enigmatic privacy obsessive, fighting to keep that dream alive. Why should I self-custody my Bitcoin? Well, it really comes down to what security model you want and, and, and why you know, Bitcoin was created in the first place. I mean, you read the white paper, you read what Satoshi said, trusted third parties are security holes. This is, um, this is a fundamental issue that we've been dealing with you know, from inception when we talk about being your own bank. Uh, it's, it's something that Satoshi sought to you know, make possible, but from a feasible perspective, most people don't want to be their own bank. You know, there's there's a reason why banks exist. People don't want to have to deal with um, all of the hassles that come with securing highly valuable things. But what we're really saying is like, if you want to have a level of bank security, if you want to be able to operate in such a way that you don't have to ask permission from a third party, then you do have to take on some responsibility. And you know, this is a problem that I've been working on for eight years now, and it, we're still a long ways away from having it solved, but I do believe you know, we, we keep making incremental progress towards uh, you know, decreasing the amount of effort that is required for someone to be their own bank. What does that look like, decreasing the amount of effort required? It involves taking all of these best practices and all of these things that we've learned over the years, really learning from other people's mistakes and catastrophes, and package, packaging that up into user-friendly software so that you know, the user doesn't have to read novels and novels of documents about what the best practices are. Rather, they just follow the instructions of what the software is telling them to do, and that puts them into a position where they are automatically following the best practices. Well, so so what does that look like a little bit more concretely? Like, say I personally am trying to start on the journey specifically, or what are, you know, two or three steps I could take to begin to um, take control of my own uh, privacy to a greater extent and stop using, um, you know, Coinbase? Yeah, so I look at it in terms of what do you have to lose and you know how much value are you storing in Bitcoin? If, if somebody's only doing your pocket money, maybe a hundred dollars, a few hundred dollars, just download one of the free uh, apps out there and, and then you have your private keys on your phone. Um, you know, that is a hot wallet. It is, it is one of the least secure ways of doing it, but it is in many ways, still better than having your keys with a third party. If you're going to up a level, if you have you know thousands of dollars, a non-trivial amount, that's when you probably want to invest fifty to hundred dollars in this a dedicated hardware device. There's a number of them out there on the market. None of them are perfect. They all have pros and cons, strengths and weaknesses. But really, any of them is better than none of them. Uh, better than having you know your 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 keys either with a trusted third party or just on a 
internet connected device, which is easier for hackers to get into. My living room is going to be littered with air gapped devices soon. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. And, and especially if you want to become a power user or just, you know, try a number of them out. Like I said, they, they all offer different security models, different user experiences. Um, you know, I have drawers and drawers full of different ones and I have plenty of opinions around which <laughs> ones I like and dislike or would recommend to people. Uh, but then really the, the next tier is the best way I can describe it is you're trying to eliminate every possible single point of failure. The problem with these bearer assets, the problem with empowering people with cryptography is that we're, we're essentially handing toxic waste to them or, or radioactive material, if you will. You know, it's a, pr a private key that unlocks the functionality to these assets, these different networks. And, you know, as long as you can keep that tiny amount of data safe so that nobody other than yourself has access to it, you're, you're sovereign, you're, you're immensely powerful within that network. You're able to use the functionality of that network. But as soon as somebody gets access to that little bit of data, they can basically step into your shoes. And generally what happens is catastrophic loss. You know, mm. one second and you have everything, the next second it's all gone. And there is no authority that can get it back for you. So it's, you know, to eliminate single points of failure, we have to implement best practices. We have to leverage functionality of these protocols to basically use multiple different keys instead of just having one key. And so uh, this is generally called multi-signature. Uh, you know, it's functionality that a lot of these protocols offer. And that just means that you create uh, keys and you store them in different places on, on different types of hardware. And you can, you can create resiliency and redundancy. And this is really what I've been doing for almost eight years now in a couple of different companies, a couple of different capacities, is trying to make it easier for non-technical, you know, normal people to put themselves into that position and, and basically create what I consider to be a better than bank level of security. Because if you think about it, even the most secure bank vault, uh, even um, you know, um, a, a fortress that is, you know, guarded by uh, military, uh, that is like a single physical location, which is in itself still a single point of failure. But with cryptography, with private keys now, we can actually decentralize your security and make it so that, you know, an attacker would actually have to compromise many different points. And, and you know, this just creates a level of security that's never been possible before. So you were profiled somewhat surprisingly by the New York Times, um, specifically about your attempts to evade the surveillance state. What steps did you take to disappear yourself? It was nearly a year long process of uh, investigating exactly all the different ways that our data is leaked. Mm. Now, I had a fair amount of, of background of understanding how your data, how you get tracked and how your data gets leaked just as you're doing normal internet browsing activities. Because I spent 10 years working uh, at an email marketing company. I was the guy collecting all of your data and running analytics on it. And as a result, I'm quite aware of just, you know, how many trackers there are uh, whenever you're doing anything on the internet. So, you know, there was there was that level of, of technical uh, sophistication of just trying to block stuff, uh, ad blockers, VPNs, so on and so forth. But that's actually the easy part. Uh, the hard part is more on you know, the, the legal side, the government side. Um, the, the most difficult being, of course, your driver license, um, things that are tied to your ownership of you know, quote unquote, real assets. Like a house. Like a house, yeah. like a car, you know, anything that you have to register with the state. That's where it gets really tricky and uh, it becomes jurisdiction specific. But, you know, there are states where it is possible to create trusts, it's possible to create corporations that you can use as proxies or shields to essentially hide, you know, the true name, the true ownership. Unfortunately, this is not simple, it's not cheap. It requires time and money and lawyers. Uh, but if you do it and you're uh, extremely diligent about it, 
you can you know, button up all of the holes, as it were, and, and prevent any of the, the data from leaking, but it requires an ongoing effort. Did you make an LLC? Oh, yes. I have you know, a number of different trusts and LLCs and, and you know, LLCs with, owned by other LLCs that are owned by trusts. You know, it, it really is a shell So you shell have layers game. to this, essentially. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have a sense of how much it costs to do that type of thing? Because presumably that's a, a barrier that um, disallows some people from actually evading surveillance the way they want to. Generally, at least a few thousand dollars. Okay. Um, but outside of just the legal costs, the I would say the higher ongoing maintenance costs um, is with my my driver license and my you know quote unquote you know residence the the address that you know the state considers to be my residence and and unfortunately the the only way that I've really been able to find a solution to that is literally find the cheapest uh, apartment house hovel what what have you that has you know a physical mailbox um, there are ways that you can get really creative um, the the shortest version of I guess a way to describe it is you know look into uh, RV life forums or you know uh, digital nomad forums. Um, there are there are some states out there. I think Nebraska, perhaps, where you can very easily, in a, a matter of a few weeks, get a, a driver's license and you know, establish quote unquote residency. But it just depends on how much effort you're willing to put into it. Both self custody and disappearing yourself require, like from the panopticon, essentially require a pretty high level of technical skill. Obviously, disappearing yourself from the state the way that you did requires so much more skill than, um, you know, self-custody. Is there any way that this can actually catch on en masse? Yeah, I, I am definitely bearish on this being adopted even by more than a small contingent of people. Uh, I would say it's really relegated more to like the celebrities and the ultra wealthy, you know, the people who for one reason or another, they may have stalkers, they may suspect that they will have stalkers, or they're just you know, high profile enough and you know, have enough wealth that you know, spending thousands of dollars doesn't really mean much to them. You know, it, it, is, it is a form of insurance policy. And you know, when it comes to both privacy and security, unfortunately, my experience over the past decade has been that basically nobody values their privacy and security until it's too late self-custody. Is that something that is likely to catch on with the general public? Or do you think the barrier might still be too high? There is a high barrier. Like I said, I've been trying to bring it down for eight years and it's there's no end in sight to that. But really part of the problem is the level of advantage that custodians and trusted third parties have when it comes to convenience and user experience because they control the entire experience. Do you think there's ever uh, a future where we can get grandmas to self-custody? Well, it's definitely possible. You know, I can tell you from experience, we have plenty of people in their 80s uh, who are clients of CASA. Uh, we have, you know, We've combined you know, both the user experience and a, a level of, of service. So it's possible, um, but there's, there's just the, the question of incentives. And, and so you know, part of the problem also is just what is the onboarding process look like? If someone wants to get into Bitcoin, right now, probably 99% of people get onboarded by signing up at an exchange. Yeah. They are, you know, start off using a trusted third party and usually that's also where they stop. They either don't look into or they don't understand that you know withdrawing to self-custody is an option or if they do see it as an option it's just too scary they don't want to deal with it. So I am I would say more bullish on a future in which we have more on-ramps by which I mean People are in, engaging in commerce and they're just directly receiving Bitcoin and probably over Lightning Network. And you know, that's something that we're starting to see happen, especially as we're seeing, for example, Noster, uh, a new protocol, a new network that has come online that is a, it's really more of a Lightning native experience. And you know, with that being integrated into a lot of the clients, people are very easily just setting up you know, self-custody wallets and directly receiving money without ever signing up on a custodian or an exchange. 
So Noster is sort of the gateway drug. Yeah, it's 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 one of many possible futures. You know, I think there's many different ways that that we can you know create new experiences where people are getting onboarded directly into a self custody environment. Well, I think we will have a diverse ecosystem and range of custody, and it doesn't actually necessarily need to be a a binary thing. It doesn't have to be just trusted third party or just self-custody. And this is actually where some of the recent innovations in uh, you know, Bitcoin scripting and programming language are, are becoming very interesting to me as a builder of self-custody products. But uh, suffice to say, some of the other ways that you could try to find a, a happy medium between these two extremes are things like uh, hybrid, custody where you have you know multiple keys that are shared perhaps between you family other semi trusted uh, experts um, I, I think that you know there is a push happening towards uh, community banking models this is something that we're seeing uh, for example with the Fediment project you know Fedi is is building software that's making it easier for you know your your local family or your local community bank uh, to be providing what you know that would still be a, a third party custody model, but that would hopefully create a world in which instead of having 10 or 100 custodians holding the majority of Bitcoin for everyone, we would have thousands, if not tens or hundreds of thousands of smaller, you know, regional custodians that are helping people uh, manage that money. So the point being, you know. It, it still gives some risk to the end users, but from a really high level, you don't have the same level of systemic risk. And that's what really worries me is if too much of the Bitcoin goes into too few hands, especially if they're like regulated companies uh, that can be easily targeted by nation states, that is when Bitcoin itself, uh, you know, as a network uh, becomes a bit more prone to you know, nation state actions. Do you self custody all of your crypto? Not all, you know, I have a, a diverse you know, range of, of different setups. What does that breakdown look like? Like how do you make that decision about how much to self custody? Well, you know, some of it is actually legal. Uh, for example, um, you know, retirement funds, it can be much more difficult to, to have you know, self custodied uh, Bitcoin as a part of a retirement fund. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's certainly far more um, easy to, to use you know, one of the products that's out there on the market. What kinds of changes to Bitcoin's protocol are needed in the coming years? It's a very controversial topic uh, <laughs> to, to say that Bitcoin needs anything at all. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I... Do I, you reject the premise? Um, so... I would say, you know, Bitcoin doesn't need anything to survive, mm -hmm. but as a technologist, I believe that in order for Bitcoin to thrive and to become a uh, more developer friendly, more secure, at least secure in terms of like end user security, uh, security models for uh, self custody, more scalable then we do want to see some changes that will make it possible for more permissionless innovation. Basically, you know, we, we don't want people to have to screw around with the Bitcoin protocol and make a lot of changes to it. That, that's very contentious. We, we went through multi-year uh, debates around making some changes to Bitcoin a few years ago. But what we're lacking is the ability for people to go out and easily create other layers of technologies that are cryptographically linked to Bitcoin, where they can basically use those as playgrounds for experimentation and be able to do whatever they want without having you know, to ask permission to change Bitcoin, without having to, to worry about accidentally doing something that breaks uh, Bitcoin itself. Well, so explain a little bit of the controversy surrounding this. So... One Without making any new enemies, ideally. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, one example is that, uh, you know, whenever you change software, especially when you're changing something like Bitcoin, which is, it is programmable money. You know, it does have a programming language, even though it's very basic in what it can do. You know, whenever you're creating new functionality, 
that is going to be leveraged by developers, it's always possible that that functionality could be used in unintended ways. And so we've had a little bit of controversy just over the past like month or two with some people leveraging functionality that got activated a few years ago to do new things that had not been anticipated. And you, you could argue that, you know, it was not the uh, intended purpose of the functionality. Like what? Uh, so, so basically, you know, people have discovered new ways of storing data in the Bitcoin blockchain that uh, it wasn't as easy to do before. Oh. It was possible, but it just wasn't as easy. And, you know, some people get upset when Bitcoin is used for, you know, non-monetary uh, transactions and purposes and, and data storage. But I'm a technologist, so I've always looked at Bitcoin as a type of database. It's just the uh, the least efficient type of database that I've ever seen. It's the most difficult database to try to work with. But as a database, as a, a store of historical records, it provides some very interesting guarantees that no database has ever been able to do before. I assume you're talking a little bit about ordinals, um, the ability to put JPEGs on the blockchain or what have you. Uh, what do you think of that? Right. I mean, I'm I'm quite neutral. I'm I'm ambivalent on it. I, I'm personally not interested in uh, you know, NFTs or uh, you know, trading other tokens that people are are creating using uh, the Bitcoin blockchain to do that. But I'm a I'm a free market proponent. So I'm not against people you know, developing new functionality and new ways of having economic interactions using Bitcoin and related technology. This is, this is controversial because I think there's generally two perspectives that are being taken with regard to you know, how Bitcoin quote unquote should be used. It's you know, how do you try to describe or define quote unquote spam, you know, spammy use of the blockchain because the Bitcoin blockchain is a scarce shared resource. And um, you can certainly run into a sort of tragedy of the common situation whenever you have a scarce shared resource. So on one hand, you have people who essentially are placing subjective uh, arguments around what they believe should be a Bitcoin transaction, you know, and, and generally that comes down to, well, a Bitcoin transaction should just be sending, you know, Satoshi's value from one person to another, and that's it. It's not about, you know, putting a bunch of data into the blockchain and then calling it something else and then saying it's a token transfer. They, their, you know, subjective perspective says that that is not the original intended design and use of Bitcoin. But as it is with any subjective arguments, people will take the opposite side of that and say, hey, you should be able to do whatever you want as, as long as the, the protocol says it's valid. So I consider the opposite side of that usually to be more of an objective economic argument, which is the only, the only definition of spam when it comes to like Bitcoin transactions and use of the network that I can figure is are you paying a competitive fee to get into the blockchain? You know, what are you willing to pay? Because if you're willing to pay more than someone else, then that probably means that what you're doing you know, is more valuable to you than what someone else is doing if they're not willing to pay as much. And that's, that seems to be the most reasonable way to decide you know, what data goes into the blockchain because we cannot put the entire world's data into the blockchain. I'm really curious, does Bitcoin have a developer shortage, especially compared to like Ethereum? There is definitely uh, far fewer developers. And I think a big part of that is because of how much more limited the functionality is, okay. how much less uh, developer friendly a lot of the tooling is. Uh, but that is changing. Uh, we are seeing, uh, you know, for example, uh, there's something called Miniscript that has been developed over the past few years, and I've, I'm seeing more and more tooling that is coming up around uh, making it easier for developers to create more complex locking scripts with many different, you know, logical branches and conditions, and and basically um, allowing us to create much more interesting self-custody security models. 
Okay, so say I were super concerned about hyperinflation, not to the point where I would make any sort of like thing like that. Um, but how should someone prepare for hyperinflation? Well, you know, as Satoshi said, it uh, it might make sense to get a little bit just in case this catches on. So, you know, holding, I've always looked at, at Bitcoin you know, from inception of when I got into it, I, I've looked at it as a sort of hedge. Um, a very long-term hedge is Bitcoin does not have any guarantees or, or even have any goals with regard to its price and ex its exchange rate. It, it has no concept of its own exchange rate. However, while we can't be sure of what's going to happen with Bitcoin's exchange rate, it's very volatile over short, medium term time periods, could go up, down, whatever. What we can be quite sure of is that the, uh, the central banks are going to continue printing more and more fiat. So the, the way that I often sum that up is, you know, there's, there's no ceiling on the Bitcoin price, but that's only because there's, uh, there's no floor on the fiat price because they're going to continue diluting it for years and generations. It's, it's basically a guarantee that uh, the central bankers themselves don't deny. Critics would say though, if you're looking at it as a hedge, we're in a time of pretty rapid inflation in the US. And so why haven't we seen a huge uptick in adoption? How would you respond to those critics? Well, where are we seeing adoption? I mean, I expect we're seeing more adoption in the countries that are seeing hyperinflation. Yeah. Uh, you know, America, of course, has seen an uptick in inflation, but it hasn't been anywhere near you know, what some countries like Venezuela, for example, have seen. So, you know, there's it's a it's a multivariate problem. And it's difficult even for me to opine upon you know, why certain people may adopt or not adopt Bitcoin. Um, you know, we are in a pretty privileged financial position. You know, basically, if you have a credit card, if you have a bank account, you probably don't have a lot of incentives to, to look into hedges against hyperinflation. You know, even, even though, you know, the, the dollar is going to continue to inflate, I think the hyperinflation risk of the dollar is still pretty low, at least relative to a lot of other countries. One thing we've noticed so far walking around this conference has been everything from Free Ross to, um, you know, screw Dr. Fauci and RFK Jr. type things. There's a cultural component that we're noticing here that seems pretty different than the cypherpunk movement. Um, your company has come under fire. Uh, you guys are in some ways Ethereum proponents. What do you think of this sort of cultural strain that's present within some of this Bitcoin community? Yeah, you know, over the years, while I'm very interested in the, the technology, um, I would say one of the more surprising things has been the uh, sociological phenomenon <laughs> and the, the interesting cultural divisions and strife that have happened, you know, for a variety of different reasons. But so, you know, Bitcoin started off and it really was uh, the earliest adopters of Bitcoin, I would say, were hardcore libertarians, anarcho-capitalists. Um, you know, they saw this as, as freedom money, and it really was, you know, us against the world. As you know, we're developing a parallel economy, if you will. Uh, and it ties in with cypherpunk movement from the sense that, you know, cypherpunks write code, they don't ask permission. They just build and they put it out there for the market to accept, digest, reject, what have you. Now, over the years, you know, Bitcoin has been you know, attacked by a number of different people and entities in, in a number of different ways, uh, especially as it has gone more mainstream and there have been boom and bust cycles and a lot of people have been hurt in various collapses and we've seen various calls, uh, you know, anti-Bitcoin, anti the entire crypto space. Uh, this has, you know, solidified even more of the sort of us against the rest of the world uh, to some of these people. And as the space has become larger and more diverse, we're actually seeing a, a fracturing even within the Bitcoin quote unquote community. You know, some people will get triggered if you even call it a community because, you know, there is a saying, which is Bitcoin is for enemies. Um, this is 
really supposed to be a, a neutral technology and platform where anyone uh, who follows the rules can use it regardless of if anyone else disagrees with who it, they are and what they're doing. So, you know, there are certain, I would say, you know, sub communities or sub groups uh, of people that have coalesced over the years. Uh, some of them are more vitriolic than others. And, uh, you know, they coalesce because they have certain shared principles, shared views of you know, what is acceptable and what is unacceptable. And so that's some of the, the stuff that we have to deal with, especially on social media. Um, there is, um, it actually comes down to some phenomenon. There, there's a great article out there. I think it's called, uh, it's like about knights and mooks. And it basically, it, it's similar to sort of political theater and phenomenon where you know, you build up your narratives, you build your audience and your following and your community. And, uh, and one of the ways that you create a more cohesive art audience is by having enemies that you attack in certain ideological ways. And so that basically that same thing is unfolded within Bitcoin. And, uh, and one of the results now is that, you know, the quote unquote Bitcoin maximalist uh, is actually a very large, diverse tent. And there are, there are different subgroups within that tent that have you know, different shared beliefs. Is the culture around it a good or a bad thing? You're, you're saying there's a lot of sort of circling the wagons. Does that lead to more people um, ultimately being interested? Is it a spectacle that people are drawn to? Um, or is there some amount of, you know, it, it's sort of straying from what people were initially attracted to? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's some of both. You know, there are certainly a lot of people who get turned off by uh, some of the vitriol from some of the groups, uh, whereas other people, you know, get interested and sucked into it. Um, but if anything, I think it may be overblown. I, I think the real high level view of it is that um, even with all of the, the drama and strife and stuff that happens on various platforms in and around Bitcoin, the vast majority of people who use Bitcoin don't know about any of that. You know, they're not tuned in to those social networks or at least those particular areas and communities uh, where the, the drama and strife is happening. They just see Bitcoin as a thing that they're using. You were talking uh, a little bit about how you really like the, the bear market, the fact that there's a little bit less hype where the hype has been deflated uh, surrounding crypto and Bitcoin. And we're seeing that a little bit at this conference. It's you know much more sparsely attended compared to past years. You were saying that you think this is actually a really good thing. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that? Absolutely. Um, I'm not a fan of the, the mania bull run phases because of the type of people that it attracts. When the really the, we might call them the tourists or the LARPers, or in many cases, the scammers, the, the con men show up. It's because they see, you know, fast, easy money. You know, they're, they're here to get rich quick. And, you know, I'm in this for the long term. I, I look at Bitcoin as our best opportunity to create a multi-generational project. You know, I think the, the average lifespan of a fiat currency is measured in decades. Uh, Bitcoin, I think we're coming up on you know, 14 years. Um, so Bitcoin is actually getting close to exceeding you know, the lifespan of the average fiat currency. And because it's an open source project, I believe it is very well positioned to last for decades, if not centuries, as long as we take care of it and maintain it. But getting back to the you know, building during bear markets, it's just, it's a lot more peaceful and easy to do because you have fewer distractions. You know, as developers, we're able to, to put our heads down and you know, focus on creating new functionality, uh, delivering, uh, based on the demands of our, our clients and our users. And that's what we've seen happening really even just this year, like the past five or six months, it's been great from a developer standpoint. You know, even though I'm neutral on stuff like ordinals and, and tokens, uh, it's just, it's interesting to see that innovation happening. Mm -hmm. And yes, it, you know, it creates some conflict, but I like to see you know, conflict and friction because, you know, that's, how we come up with, with new challenges, which we then 
find new solutions to. Jamison Lopp, thank you for sitting down with Reason. Great to be here.